Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We've got a game for you today on the Twin Rivers. This is going to be a 3 versus 3 matchup. I've done a couple of 6 versus 6s recently. Maybe not too recently, over the last couple of months or so. But this is going to be a 3 versus 3. It is right in the middle of the average Joe's rankings. It's 1300 through 1600 and very well balanced. So hopefully this will be a good game. Let's go ahead and introduce everybody and we'll jump straight into the action. This is... Uh, Right, left, top, bottom, I guess it doesn't really matter on this map. Let's go with the right-hand team. We've got Orange. That is going to be Mech Sengoku. He's taking Seraphim. Then the other front player is Shep taking Cybran. Then in the back, on the air slot, we've got Momo. He is also Cybran. Not a whole lot of faction diversity on this one. No love for the UEF whatsoever. There's a lot of sad, manly men out there today. We've got Aeon in the other air slot. This is going to be Inquisitor for the left-hand team, or Southern. Michelio is going to pick up Seraphim, and then another Seraphim for SA in the brilliant blue. So, three Seraphims, two Cybrans, one Aeon. Like I said, this is going to be a slightly bland matchup unit-wise, but hopefully we can get a little bit of extra strategy going on here. Hopefully these guys will work together. I hate it when we have a Twin Rivers where everybody kind of works in their own separate little corners and then one of them dies and the whole thing falls over because nobody can adapt and nobody's working together with each other. Um... Right off the bat, I do see we have some early reclaim attempted here. We've got purple and orange. That is, got to get my name straight here, Shep and Mech. They are going to be pushing up towards front. We've got tank and scout for both of these guys. Exactly even matchup. Same three units sent to the same spot. Tanks both going to engage actively on each other, but this is going to be a win for yellow because he's also got his scout firing, whereas this one is on hold fire so that he cloaks. I don't think the cloak was worth losing that battle. And there's my pop-up. I really should have fixed that before I started this cast. All right. <laughs> that was extremely close. The engineer was able to finish reclaiming the tank, which was one shot shy of dying from the Mantis, but the Selen is still alive, which means that this engineer is going to die a horribly painful death. And blue is going to pick up the reclaim. I should say the lighter blue. That is SA. He's going to dip into that mass. So, the left-hand team is going to get the early reclaim advantage. We've got Michelio pulling in uh, 400 or so. Not too much. It's a nice little boost, but this is not a super mass intensive map. Then we got pushing 1k for SA, who's also overflowing to his teammates. That is going to help his air player get off the ground. We can see we've already got uh, two air factories online building the transport. Don't know why you're building the transport in the factory with less adjacency. That is a very power intensive item to build. You should probably be using your one next to the hydro to do that. But to each his own, there's the transport. That means he's going to get his drops off very early. And on the northern side, we're still making interceptors for blue. Not a transport in sight, but a whole lot of power rings. Right now on the top of the board, we've got Shep pulling in 22 mass per tick. He is filling out nicely let's see we're missing an expansion mechs right here that Shep already has nothing on these sides so yeah Shep was just a little more efficient on his expansion than the other guys were that gap will close very very soon so we've got mech pushing over to the left nice little run by with this tank and scout but unfortunately not going to score a kill on that one when you have a situation like this you always want to uh, heal that mass extractor because if you start an upgrade on that damaged mass extractor once the upgrade finishes you will have to repair the mass extractor for the additional cost of the t2 instead of the t1 and this costs basically no mass it would cost uh, 9 to 11 mass to fix that whereas it's going to be a couple of hundred mass once you upgrade to the t2 so always good to keep your mass extractors healed up whenever you have the opportunity now on this island over here we have a drop. Three engineers coming in for Inquisitor. He is going to be able to get that island. No problemo. Actually, we don't know that it's an island or not. We have a dead end in the map right here. And since the name of the map is Twin Rivers, I think we can safely assume that the water traverses in this here direction. 
in the diagonal, and this is probably a landmass up here, so I should probably not call these islands, but Inquisitor's going to grab this right-hand ambiguous landmass, and also got an engineer coming in from SA. He is not content with the three engineers already over there. He's going to throw down land factories himself. And then on the left side, we've got Michelio. He is going to throw down a land factory right there. But we do have the transport coming back, so I would be curious to see if Inquisitor is going to try a drop over there as well. Got a Jester moving in. Nice move from Momo. He is going to be able to snipe off that Engineer. No problem whatsoever. But the Interceptor advantage goes heavily to Inquisitor. So despite having a large amount of health for a T1 unit, that Jester is going to be shot down pretty promptly. Although it did succeed in its mission of snagging the Engineer. And you'll have to pardon me, guys. I forgot to change my software for my hotkey setup on my mouse. So that means that I'm getting the network not network, the console, when I accidentally click my scroll wheel the wrong way. I will correct that in the next cast to be sure. For some reason, I, I'm not sure why, it's supposed to switch automatically, but apparently it did not in this one. This is a bad move right here. We've got a scout, so we know that he has all of these tanks on radar. You do not, repeat, do not want to advance your tanks into the face of a much larger group because that means you've just given a handy dandy mass donation to the other player. All of these beautiful little T1 tanks there, they're going to be sucked up for mass by the other team and turned into more tanks that will be hurled at your face. Although there is a point defense here, so that is a nice little touch. Michelio can sit fairly safe there for now, at least until the T1 units give way to T2. Well, if a lot of um, T1 artillery were to come in, that might be a different story, but they are not. So we've got a couple of T1 bombers here. Looks like Inquisitor is going to recycle those T1 bombers that were originally over here to block. Well, no, there is still one over there. Must be a couple of additional ones. T1 bombers are always worth it to build. You can hurl them at the other players, and they will kill off engineers, build power, T1 power, anything and everything that they can get their grubby little mitts on, they will knock out of the game. You can see right there we've got, I think that was a radar. Yes, that was a radar, and two T1 engineers. Nice kill for that one. And then on this side, we got an engineer kill, and uh, not a total waste, but somewhat of one. All right, on the left-hand side, we do have a land factory going down for Inquisitor. Inquisitor's interceptors are slightly spread out here. I think he can still pull off a win, especially with that beautiful entry. No, ah, I thought he had the turn, but he turned the wrong way. Interceptors are actually a little bit hard to micro. I have not entirely mastered the art, but that was a beautiful split there. Inquisitor pushing four interceptors to the north to snag that transport as it was coming in. So that's going to be a drop denial for Momo. That's going to be nasty in a little while because Inquisitor now has both expansions. That's going to give him a huge ma mass advantage over Momo. And when one air player has that big of an advantage over the other player, you're going to be in for a very bad time. The left side of the map's looking a bit stagnant, but on the right here, We've got an advance from Shep. Shep is going to bring an engineer up to build a radar, so he has some advance notice when things are coming his way. He does have the gun upgrade on his commander. That's going to give him the extra range that he needs. Start throwing down overcharges, kill off that T1 point defense, and progress easily. He also has the stealth. I was wondering why the T1 point defense wasn't firing. That is a beautiful tool in the arsenal of the cyber and you can stand outside the vision radius of t1 and t2 point defense and kill them from afar a lot of people don't realize that the uh the attack range of the acu with the gun upgrade is slightly bigger than the vision radius of the t2 point defense so unless you have advanced units the cyber ACU can kill off a T2 firebase without ever taking any damage. Really cool thing that you can use it for. SA has gun upgrade as well, and he's going to have a slightly beefier commander even after one vet on the Cybercom. But you got to remember, Cybercom can stay in the fight um, as long as he can back up and regen a little. The regen is way stronger on the Cyber Commander. You can see 21 regen per tick versus 10 for SA on that unupgraded commander. 
or unvetted, rather. Um, and he... So with double the regen, even though Cybern starts at a lower point after, you know, 45 seconds or a minute of combat, the Cybern ACU is going to come ahead of the Seraphim ACU, and this is not looking good at all. We've got a huge group of Mantis here, that is 35 or so Mantis closing in on the ACU, and that is exactly what you don't want to have happen, because the Mantis are excellent for swarming ACUs. They deal a good amount of damage, they're fast and squirrely, they get under your feet, you can't move around, you can't escape, and then you end up exploding. That is always something that you want to avoid. Even in daily life, no one likes to explode. I mean, can you imagine just wake up on the wrong side of the bed one morning, roll off the bed, hit the floor, and explode? Also, your parents might be mad at you if you still live at home. I mean, I know they get on to you for cleaning, for not cleaning up your room, but the explosion, I'm sure, would not help matters. And SA, I think, is about to die. Oh, brilliant run by by Orange. That is a huge swarm of tanks moving on the right. Got two places where we got things going on here. Uh, SA is down to 400 health, single overcharge, and he's done. And boom, degraded by the gun damage. This is not the world's biggest army, but it is definitely enough tanks to threaten the air player who has absolutely nothing in his base. He's going to try to throw down a T1 point defense. Hopefully that will come online. I don't think it will get finished before these tanks move in that is a gunship producing the specter will be a tremendous help in denying these tanks need to finish off that t1 point defense to prevent further incursion i spy a mercy that has been pinged it is sighted shep is running for his life one mercy is not going to do it though two or three would have been a serious threat Shep can soak the damage from one and still get out just fine. So these Thams are going to move into the base here, killing off engineers. Build power is the critical resource at any stage of the game. Even though Inquisitor is pulling almost double the mass per tick. Actually, yes, he is pulling double the mass per tick from Momo. Um, if he doesn't have the build power to turn that into units, it doesn't do him a whole lot of good. Although at this stage of the game, he can turn that extra mass into mass extractor upgrade. So it's not as big a deal as it could be, but that does mean that Momo will have a chance to catch up on interceptor production, which he kind of needs to do because Inquisitor has very, very hard air control. Now, one thing that I do see here, this is kind of a waste of mass. Have a uh, T1 factory at this point in the game burning T1 scouts constantly. That is five mass per tick. That is a fifth. A solid fifth of Momo's eco is going to this factory that is only building scouts that are just idly piling up in the back here, not doing a whole lot of good. Um, a T1 scout stream is an awesome tool versus Cybern in the later mid game when you actually have eco for that or in the late naval game when you need constant view of the oceans, T1 spam does have its place, T1 scout spam rather, but that place is most assuredly not at this point in this game where you're burning that much of your eco on a T1 scout. Shep is going to get forced back here. We got a T2 Seraphim commander. The gun comm is strong for Cybern, but with the air cover overhead, which is revealing his stealth commander, and all of the extra build power on this ACU, plus this ACU's full health, he is at half. That is going to be a fairly simple win for the Seraphim T2 commander. He's going to be able to push Shep back quite easily with that T2 point defense. Shep may run up and overcharge. That does look like what is planned. I'm going to try to get this point defense, yes. And there is no longer any air coverage, so you can see he is just... Calmly plinking away, going to kill that T2 point defense and then kill the T1. Well done, Shep. Kudos to you, my good sir, for pulling that off. And you may wonder to yourself, now why on earth would there be a T1 wall grid like that? And that, my friends, is a unit clog. It prevents transports from dropping on that exact location. It really screws up the pathfinding for transports. It's incredibly cheap. And if the transport does pull off a drop in any of these one any of these locations here um 
It is a gauntlet to run for T1 units. It will completely and totally mess up the pathfinding. It'll take forever for the units to filter here, and it makes them really easy to kill for T1 mobile artillery. Lots of DPS brought to bear, not a whole lot the units can do to dodge it. Got the TML on that ACU. Mech has gone for <laughs> one of the most annoying combat upgrades in the game. He has hurling tack missiles at this base, and I do believe that hurling is the sponsored word for the day. Um, <laughs> for some reason, I get attached to single words, although I would challenge anyone to come up with a lot of descriptive words over the course of a 30-minute cast without repeating themselves. It is harder than you would think. Might need to break out a thesaurus once you really get into it. Uh, these tacks are going to snipe off all of the T2 mechs, even this brand new shiny one that just finished. Oh no! Here comes the tack, and it is pointless. Life is futile. It's just going to die anyway. Michelio is down to a whopping 9 mass per tick, which is just sad. And the T1 scouts are still streaming in from Momo Uchila. Now, this player being lost would have ended a team had Inquisitor not claimed both islands because he is pulling 49 mass per tick even after abandoning his upgrades in favor of producing T2 gunships and swift winds. The gunships were what allowed him to clean up all of the units that had snuck around the corners. We got a fire base over here. Michelio is assimilating this side of the map and that Inquisitor is going to be able to lock all of this down. So it's going to be a huge eco for this air player. Shep has actually pulled even though. He's got the three forward mass extractors. He's killed off that one right there. And he has done a fair bit of upgrading to his mass extractors in the back. That's going to net him a total of 50 mass per tick. A very respectable number, especially when you compare it to people like Inquisitor, who have way more mass extractors than he does. Now once Inquisitor starts... Uh, plopping those T2 upgrades on all of these mass extractors is going to be an entirely different story. But for now, Shep is king of the eco, pulling 53 per tick. And he is also building his own T1 air. Good for him. All of these interceptors are out of fuel. That is such a sad sight to see. That uh, anytime you see air units just creepy crawling across the map, it just makes you want to shoot yourself in the face because you're like, you need to be over there and they won't move over there. Was that a control K? I think that was a control K. Control K, all of the out of fuel interceptors, they will fall to the ground. They can be reclaimed. No problem there. Oblivion turret going down just to help lock down this side. Mech Sengoku has pulled forward with his commander. He's got gun. T2 and tack launcher. He's going to try to get some tacks launched, some of this stuff further towards the back, but I don't think it's going to work out for him. We got plenty of TMD over here, and he is going to keep launching. That may have been at the. Nope, not at the ACU. That is. Yes, it was. Wide miss, though. Michelio was able to move over to the side. We got T2 bombers out here. Corsairs pulling in. We got T1 anti air going down frantically building with like 10 engineers <laughs> oh man Shep still on top of the eco here Corsair's not really shooting at anything not sure what's what messed up the pathfinding there are gonna zap that engineer and fall from the sky That is the end of that. Mech Sengoku just kind of hanging around the outside corner here. You know, he's actually in range. Uh, he should be able to reach that middle island, yes, with the attack launcher, should he choose to do so once these T2s start coming online. If I were Inquisitor, knowing that there is a TAC com there, I definitely would have launched or would have built TMD before I built T2 mass extractors. This was a highly effective run by here. We've got a T2 power down, several T1 powers. There was a point defense that came online, but a little too late. I'm going to try to chew through those Mantis, but that is a huge amount of damage, especially to Eco there. Inquisitor still pulling 1.4k. He has two T2 P-Gens out on the island in fairly good protection. So, 
Not the end of the world. He is still balanced on power, but that's going to push his RAS upgrade back some. He lost a mass extractor, got a bit of damage to his base, and also losing that third T2P gen that you always need before you try to upgrade resource allocation. Going down a TMD right there, going to try to protect these mass extractors. Still nothing going on in the north. Need to throw down a T2 engineer up there. Handy dandy transports are a good thing. Nice little fire base here for Mech Sengoku. Actually, that is possibly a little bit of overkill. We got a T2 point defense, two T1s, TMD, all your essentials. Um, finer point of base making. I would do T2 point defense with the T1s directly in front so that they get the brute impact of the T1 tanks that are coming towards the point defense and hopefully absorb some of the damage from T1 artillery that may be there. And uh, that puts your more valuable longer range target in the back. Also, it doesn't clump up your point defense right next to each other, so that a single T1 artillery shot damages both. Two for one deal for one player, and horrible death and mayhem for the other player. And there go the tack launchers. Going to snipe off these T2 and attempted T2 mexes. Gonna get there before the upgrades are done. Best possible time to snipe a mass extractor is right at the 99% mark on construction because that means he's invested all of the mass that he's going to invest in to get the upgraded mass extractor and he gets none of the return. But it's really hard to pull that off because usually basic intel is not enough to know when that upgrade is going to be finished. But it is really painful. I'm sure all of us at one point or another have had that happen where we are so, so close and that mass extractor gets sniped. My, my least favorite is when I'm playing air and it happens with an early strap bomber and I have my baby mechs that I am nurturing and pouring my life force into and then all of a sudden along comes a mean and nasty strap bomber and snipes the thing at like 85 or 90 percent and I'm just no I used all of my mass from that uh, power generator that I was reclaiming and all of the mass from my storage and I almost had this T3 mass extractor and you killed it and that's when life gets really depressing. So, we've got T2 gunships moving in. This is another drastic source of depression for some people. Right up there with the tack snipe is the inevitable T2 gunship snipe. It's there when you can't do anything about it, but he does have four T1 anti-air turrets back here. He is gonna run back towards those. Question is, do they have enough accumulated damage to kill those? And I think the answer is no. I uh, got some interceptors moving in, swift winds, doing their, nope, I was about to say doing their best to kill those off, but it's not going to matter at this point, point. and boom, oh, that was beautiful, the entire cloud of enemy interceptors gets knocked out of the sky, not a single swift wind dead, and a reasonable amount of gunships dead in the process, that was not a huge loss at all, so, the TAC commander is dead, there's no more TML to worry about, and now we have an empty base for the northern team. This just happened to the southern team, they recovered quite nicely. The northern team does not have the advantage of control of the islands, but they should be able to recover fairly well from this. Um, one concern that I do have is that purple is relatively immobile. Um, he has very, very few mobile combat units. Yellow has Ilshivas and Flak. So this is going to steamroll the left-hand side here. Purple has got to get something online to stop those. He's got T2... No, he has T3 land. Beautiful. But he's building an engineer. Really need to get some loyalists out would be my recommendation. The loyalists are going to have the speed necessary to chase down all of these units as they're pulling their run-bys. Maybe drop two loyalists and then start building bricks because bricks are the mainstays. You always want to have those on the northern side here, building up these mass extractors again. Interesting note, someone mentioned this to me a few days ago. I can't not remember if it was in the live cast or not, but I'll mention it again. Excuse me, folks. Got to keep killing my mic here. Um, 
when you have a T2 mass extractor get sniped by attack missile, the wreck has zero mass, so reclaiming it doesn't do any good. And you lose the potential T2 mass extractor if you build a T1 mass extractor because it starts it and you get no reclaim value back and then you have to start your upgrade all over again. However, if you have a T2 engineer nearby, you can build a T2 mass extractor on top of the wreck and it finishes halfway because there's a wreck there. And that is just some weird thing with the way TAC missiles behave. I'm not entirely sure what the dealio is. Um, they deal 6,000 damage, which is enough to kill the mass extractor and the wreck underneath it, if I'm not totally mistaken. Um, actually, it is more than enough, because the wreck has less health than the actual building. But anyway, if you do have the wreck there, you need to build the T2 mass extractor directly instead of building T1 first. Now we've got T1 point defense over here that is going to do a marvelous job of holding up some of the advancement of these stamps. Corsairs moving in, trying to lay down some blanket damage. Corsairs are a awesome, awesome multi-purpose unit. The only thing they're bad at is air damage. They are by far the worst air damage of any T1, T2 unit outside of transports. And that is mass based comparison, not unit to unit, for those of you who are going to say I'm wrong. Um, Corsairs are the best balancing point of the T2 bombers, and this was actually a discussion on the last tutorial video that I did, the UEF one. If you haven't watched it, definitely need to go check that out. Just a quick overview of how to play UEF to your best advantage in the typical game that you're going to encounter in ladder or in short team games. I don't talk about the T4 and game ender stage too much, but it is a good overview of the units. Um, wow, mental lapse. Forgot where I was going with that. Oh well. Oh, oh yes, Corsairs. Um, the, <laughs> the UEF Janus is all about area damage is terrible the worst t2 bomber at um single target damage and is relatively easily dodged and then you've got the seraphim bomber which is awesome single target damage ridiculously easy to dodge but the worst aoe and then the corsair is kind of a balance between the two it deals the majority of its damage to a single target but it does have enough aoe that you can wipe out t1 and t2 units effectively with it especially engineers for build power and then um, it does have awesome sniping potential. It's relatively hard to dodge. So it's just a nice mix. It is a very excellent tool that Cybern has at its disposal. And I spy a monkey lord. Been waiting for one of these pop up. As soon as I saw that T3 engineer come out of the factory, I knew that very, very soon we were going to be seeing one of these. It has been pinged. There was a scout across it, so these guys are going to know exactly what is coming their way. As always, intel is key, and I spy mercies. Why are there mercies? I don't really know. have not seen a good opportunity. Perhaps he had his ACU a little farther forward, and the air player built some just in case, but those have not been able to be utilized. I love how they're technically landed, but they're just kind of floating. They're packed up, but just sitting above the ground. Almost like the floating reclaim that pops up on some maps. Looks kind of natural from an aerial view, but once you really zoom in and start looking at it, it is weird as all get out. So on this side, we've got mass extractors going down, we've got reclaim happening. Need to get some more engineers over here to suck up this mask more quickly. Inquisitor pulling 192 mass per tick, tons of T2 mass extractors. And no T3 as of yet, but he's got a lot of his mass extractors capped. Plus, he's got these up here. So very, very solid eco from him. Shep is second highest, but he is 80 behind. And he is sacrificing some of his eco upgrade potential to build this Monkey Lord. So this is going to be the gambit of the Monkey Lord. Building one of these early T4 units is always, always a toss-up. Because if your T4 does not succeed, you've donated that mass to the other team and the other team already has an eco advantage over you because they reinvested the mass instead of building a T4. So if you're going to build a T4, you got to make sure to micro it, got to make sure to kill something with it, and you do not want to lose it stupidly because if you do, you are handing a near irreversible advantage 
to the other team. That is plop. Here's 14k mass right in your base, pulling 14k mass out of thin air because I don't know what 81% of 17,000 is right off the top of my head. Somebody whip out a calculator and do that in the comments. I know there's somebody who will. All right, got loyalists moving down on the left-hand side, building three loyalists and no bricks, it appears. More loyalists on the way. Very nice. Check out the reclaim numbers here for a minute. We got 13K for Inquisitor, 9K for Shep, which is kind of surprising, and 10K for Momo, and then Michelio with 20K. These guys are kind of insignificant because they died fairly early in the game, so no major reclaim numbers there, especially since they were on the sides that were being advanced upon, which means you're not really claiming any reclaim fields. Rhino's coming in. That is the OP wall section for you there, folks. 4,000 health for two mass cost and a voice break. That is nothing for infinite HP. <laughs> but the Rhinos do pack a pretty good punch. They're going to knock out four of those wall sections and then decide that they have eaten enough of a hole in the fence and they're going to push their way through. Got more ASF out for Inquisitor, actually than for, or not Inquisitor, for Momo, than Inquisitor. But Inquisitor has a swift win. The key here is going to be the first engagement because if Momo can engage correctly and pull around the backside, he can pretty much kill off every single swift win in the first turn or two, and then he only has the ASF to deal with. These swift wins just have such slower movement speed and larger turning radius than the ASF do. Maybe not larger turning radius, slower turning speed. That would be a more accurate wording of what I intended. So we've got Loyalists out. Still three. Just trying to see if one ran by. This run by, though, is doing very healthily. Rhinos packing far more DPS into their unit count than UEF does. Um, these T2 tanks on a one-to-one -one basis will demolish UEF, but on a mass-to-mass -mass basis, UEF wins. But these things would lose to Obsidians and Ilshivas, which is kind of the concern that they have at the moment. We do have a T3 tank here. That Otham is going to head over to the right-hand side, and here comes the Monkey Lord. This is going to be a problem. We've got a Restorer, we've got a couple of T2 gunships, second Restorer. We've got a handful of Mercies, but those aren't going to do a whole lot of good considering the uh, considering that the Monkey Lord has its own anti-air. It's not super effective at knocking down um, Mercies, but it can knock down one or two before the Monkey Lord starts taking damage. Awesome ability to have. Very nice. So this is probably the most exposed T3 power generator that I've ever seen in my life. There are no point defense. There are a handful of T1 units and there is a T2 shield. I would be going that way with my Monkey Lord because if you kill the T3 power generator, you're gonna kill everything around it right here and you're gonna take all the power away from Michelio, which then means that even if he killed your Monkey Lord, he could not use your Monkey Lord because he wouldn't have the power to build anything, even though he has tons and tons of mass. Michelio is going to move over to the right-hand side here, try to take up residence with his old buddy Inquisitor, and see if those shields can protect him from the advance of the Monkey Lord. Restore is trying to lay down some damage on that, but the slight air advantage that belongs to uh, Momo will be manipulated. And that is the end of damage to the Monkey Lord. That Restore is going to pull back. All right, so Monkey Lord is now on the Rampage. Rampage! I hope everyone watches our... Um, I cannot talk. I hope everyone watches Archer. Because Archer is an amazing show. And it has infinite references for pretty much anything you want to talk about. So, yes. Monkey Lord is on a Chemotherapy Rampage. And there's a lot of T2 point defense, holy cow. That is actually sapping the strength of this thing very, very quickly. There's the veterancy. Now it does not matter any longer. <laughs> Going to rake those T2 point defense down with its laser. More yummy, yummy veterancy. And it can pretty much just now stomp through that phase. No problem, no challenge. Lots of mobile flak moving in. That is an awesome tool versus the restorers, but here comes Mr. Strap Bomber. Pro level micro there. 
hover bombing for a complete miss. <laughs> that is fantastic. Awesome. Strap Bomber going to pull around for another pass, but the Monkey Lord is not looking very healthy. Michelle Yeoh is going to close in, land that overcharge, and it is now a mass donation. But T3 power is down. A lot of mass is down. All of the point defense and build power is down. I think that Monkey Lord was worth it. Michelle Yeoh is down to 47 mass per tick. Inquisitor is still sitting at 205, but Shep is rapidly catching up with 169 and 131 for Momo round out the teams and it is roughly roughly even slight advantage to the northern team i think actually i'm sure slight advantage to the northern team Alrighty then we've got loyalists still pounding away here things are kind of hanging back with the monkey lord went forward I'm gonna kill off that pesky sam those are always annoying when you're trying to front your air so that uh, units in your possession do not take damage, but it's always shameful when a single Sam is able to damage 5 or 6 or 7 AS up and cost you an air fight. It is the worst thing ever. <clears throat> strat bombers, three strat bombers on the southern side, possibly setting up for a snipe, but I don't think there is enough as of yet to actually pull one. Shep sitting inside three shields. And Momo is sitting inside too, so you're going to need more than three Strat Bombers, buddy, to pull that off. Although he does have a fairly significant amount of Restorers. Honestly, I would stop building Restorers because there's a whole lot of Mobile Flak out on the field. And Restorers are not going to get very far versus Mobile Flak. For those of you who still think the T3 gunships are overpowered... What? What? Accidental control K. <laughs> oh my word. That is embarrassing. <laughs> I thought that I had missed something. He tried to control K his walls and control K his ACU instead. But you know what? I hate to say it, he, down to 40 mass per tick, yes, that removes an ACU from the game, which is a snipe prevention mechanism when you have two people alive, but he was not really contributing that terribly much to this situation because he lost his base. So at this point, I don't think it makes a difference whether Inquisitor or Michelio was the one that actually rebuilt the base. What matters is that the base gets rebuilt. So, it is down to a one versus two fight, and air control is totally in the hands of Momo. And I say that with one small reservation. I think there's enough restorers here to kill the amount of ASF on this side. But, these restorers are not going to be able to block incoming attack units or drops effectively... And Strat Bombers are going to be able to sni be sniped off by Momo's ASF. So I am going to give the air control benefit of the doubt to Momo Uchilla just because he is going to be able to manipulate the map better than Inquisitor is. He also have this Strat Bomber up here damaging these mass extractors, slowly whittling away at Inquisitor's eco, but Inquisitor is still pulling 235 to 194 and 157 mass disadvantage but not in a bad spot to be honest pulling 300 plus right now with the reclaim and once he sucks up that monkey lord wreck that is going to do wonders for him as well he still has the island even though he did get a couple of things bobbed out so he's still in a good situation i don't think that this is a lost game by any means whatsoever we got a Monkey Lord coming up here. I'm actually going to bump the speed up. We're getting slightly, slightly stagnant. I'll do my best to catch everything, but we're going to bump it up just a hair. That Monkey Lord, I'm sure, is going to immediately be sent south. And on the northern side, Momo is pull putting down more T3 power. And this is the stage where you really want to be reclaiming your T1 power grids because they're taking up a lot of space that could be better utilized with other structures. And you can get that mass back. Yummy, yummy mass doesn't matter where you get it from. It is always a good thing to have as long as you're not buying it from the dealer on the corner because he has really impure stuff. 
your buildings will fall apart, your foundations will crumble, it's just not of the quality that you need for massive army building. Restorers are going to move in, there is a large amount of flak there, I would not advise that. Yes, he's going to pull back, if he doesn't have to get in there, he's not going to. ASF moving southward for Momo. Still looking like a slight numerical advantage to the restorers, plus we now have an ASF wing. So Inquisitor is looking good at the moment. He does not have any readily apparent bad weaknesses, and he is throwing down a GC. Now I know there's a Monkey Lord over here to worry about, but when you have this cloud of restorers here, it can be dealt with. Queue up the Strat Bombers to kill all of the uh, mobile flak. Once the mobile flak is out of the way, move in with the restores, and that's about a 35, 30 second kill for that many restores and the T2 gunships. Those restores are going to move northward. There's a single lonely flak standing guard there. One flak is better than none, but five is better than one. He is going to retreat, though, and that is that. We're still sitting staring at each other across the pass. There is already a GC done there, so we're working on our second one. Monkey Lord can easily be denied, no matter what the situation. Shep pulling 219, Inquisitor 253, and Momo is still behind in the back, although that is understandable since Shep does have two bases. Let's see what he's working on. Not a whole lot, to be honest. He is building air, and that's about it. You gotta admire his eco balance, though. He is popping back and forth between the plus and minus, sitting right comfortably in the bottom third of his storage he has mass to instantly react to something but he is well balanced he's not wasting any very nicely done on that one so this gc is about two-thirds on the northern side we got mass extractors rebuilt so that is going to contribute back to the eco of inquisitor and a second monkey lord going down for shep Alrighty then Two close calls early in the game, but it is really leveled out here. Looking at a bit of a stalemate at the moment. Nice interceptor cluster, or not interceptor, ASF cluster for Momo. Looks like he is starting to move somewhere. Um, with the anti-air emplacements and flak on the northern side, in addition to Shep building his own ASF, this is actually a very competent air force. I think that the northern side can still handle anything the south side throws at it as long as they work together. Either that, or one player needs to give the other player all the ASF so they can just micro it by themselves. Sometimes that is actually a good option to take. Alright, GC is just going to sit there. He looks so cuddly. And there comes the second one. All right. Finally going to see a push here, I think. GZs coupled with the restorers are going to make a pass at the middle ground here. GC is going to be able to kill off any flak that comes into the area. And that is going to let the restorers do their thing. Now, there's two monkey lords and two GCs. Two GCs should deal with two Monkey Lords no problem whatsoever as long as there is not huge amounts of painstaking micro which can make life difficult but not unwinnable and then couple that with the restores and I think Pink can roll Shep no problem whatsoever. Shep just kind of sitting dormant here started building another T3 or not T3 T4 unit. But kind of abandoned that mid process. There goes the assistance again, probably getting something upgraded and needed the mass elsewhere. So we've got a brick under fire. GCs are now in range of the base. We've got the air fight coming in. That is going to be a bad engagement for Inquisitor, but missed turn for Momo. Everybody is slipping up on the air fight here, it seems. And there's a rake across the restores. Now Inquisitor had the perfect opportunity to fall in behind all those interceptors and kill them, Strategic but did not detected. work it out. And there's the new. <laughs> totally missed that being built, but we're going to see where it lands. That is for sure. All right, one GC down. 
both monkey lords down, but that GC is alive and well thanks to the assistance of the restorers. This nuke is headed directly for the airbase. That is going to be catastrophic for Inquisitor. It's looking so good. He's got the GC online. There's no answer to it other than this monkey lord, which may or may not get built before the GC can get back there. GC's got vet on it. Poof goes the airbase up in flames almost 100 percent of the build power gone there are two factories left in the back that is the t3 land and the t3 air hq inquisitor is going to have to start over from scratch let's hope this can vet up enough ah kill the acu then you don't have to worry about the monkey lord monkey lord just finished and it is pointless all right gc is alive and that, my friends, was a Telemazer. <laughs> Epic game. Brilliant ending. That was right down to the Y. Is it going to be a tie? Is it going to be a tie? Oh, my goodness. I think the bomb hit and it did not actually calculate the damage yet. That was the next tick of the game sequence. But the bombers wouldn't have killed him in one pass anyway. So he was in safe territory for one more pass anyway, excellently played by both sides. Couple of turnarounds there. I thought for sure the Southern team was going to fold when it came down to the land spam there. And then the kill on the Northern side had a little trouble dealing with a huge eco pumping out for Inquisitor. Ah, he would have had it won. He had it won if not for that Telemazer. And then the Telemazer for the win for the right hand team. Well done, Momo. All right. That is going to wrap up this game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. I definitely enjoy playing through it. Um, as far as this week goes, I've got the live cast coming up on Saturday. That is at 6 p.m. Eastern United States time. And it will most likely be the last one that I do for a few weeks. Um, this week I'm recording a couple of extra casts. And next week I'm recording a couple extra casts. And then the following week is my wedding day. So, um, two weeks from this Saturday, I will be married and no, wait a minute, three weeks from this Saturday, three weeks from this Saturday. It is May 16th. I cannot even get my dates straight. It is two Saturdays. Don't listen to me ramble. I know not of what I speak. Just know that a couple weeks out, I am getting married. So I'm going to get a backlog of casts up. I've already got one cast that I've done, um, just to set on the back burner for YouTube and it'll release while I'm gone. Hopefully the content will stay consistent while I'm gone on my honeymoon and doing various and sundry other things, setting up house, etc. And then I'll be back in about two weeks um, when I go off and do my other stuff. So I am not going to disappear. You've got a whole nother full week of normal content coming up. Just kind of trying to keep you guys informed of what's going on. And I do apologize if in some of these casts I seem a little bit absent-minded um, between trying to get all of these details sorted and everything else going on. Sometimes I'm a little bit mentally fried. I can tell you, though, I have big plans for things coming up after um, once I get a little more free time and am able to delve into these things a bit more. I've got some things that I'm going to be opening up on the channel as far as a serious Hero of the Storm section and then prepping up for just general strategy. I am sure you guys are going to enjoy what's coming up and I hope that you will stick with me through all of the videos to come. As always, thank you so much for watching and so much for being supportive. Additionally, one more note, if you are a Patreon supporter, um, $5 and above. Go check out the Patreon page or your email if you haven't checked it in a while. There is a reward tier now for anyone donating a few bucks at a time. Um, that will begin June 1st when I'm coming back from other stuffs. So if you want to claim your prize, participate in some of the things that I'm offering, you need to dig up some replays and have those ready for me. I'll be diving into that as soon as I get back from wedding things. And with that, I'm out of here, guys. As always, I already said it, but I do mean it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the live cast on Saturday.